And what I would like to do now is actually to introduce you to Lynn Rutherford because I hadn't met Lynn before um, she'd taken part in our benchmark work and she hasn't met us at Learning Technologies. She's just been getting on and doing stuff at Brambles. She's been making stuff happen and it's absolutely amazing because I'd like to invite Lynn now to show us how you've turned Andrew's model and you've never met before into real action um, at Brambles. So this is Lynn Rutherford, everybody, and uh, we'll have some questions and discussion afterwards. But keep writing down the things that you are finding out that you think you might be able to do differently because Lynn's going to give you plenty more to choose from. Go for it. Oh, thank you. And hi, everybody. And um, it's great to be here. I've never, I cannot believe, I must have been living in a parallel universe. I've never been to learning technologies before. Um, and I've been wandering around downstairs with my, with my eyes this big and my mouth hanging open because I didn't know it was here. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Bramble story um, and how we partnered um, with the business to, to create some really neat stuff. Um, if you've never heard of Brambles, you're forgiven. Has anyone here heard of Brambles? Oh, you're cheating, yeah. Don't worry, seven and a half years ago when I joined them, I'd never heard of them either. So who are we? Just very briefly, who is Brambles? We are a global supply chain logistics, whoops, we're a global supply chain logistics organization. Um, we've got 14,000 employees around the world. We're in about 60 countries. And they range from about 5,500 people in North America to three people in Japan. So you can see the, the challenges we have. Our revenue last year was um, 5.5 billion US dollars. Our profit was a billion US dollars, so not a bad uh, profit margin. We're, we're, a, we're a very successful organization. We move stuff around the world. That's what we do. We're in um, all the industries you can think of, from uh, manufacturing through to retail. We have clients, some of our clients are probably sitting here, Coca-Cola, uh, Nestle, Unilever, P&G. We move their stuff and we get it into the Tesco's and the Waitrose of this world. That's who we are. We've got about, just by the way, about 500 million pallets and crates that move around the world all the time. Main brands are Chep and Ifco. You can imagine how good we have to be at not losing stuff because we own those, those, uh, those um, pallets and those crates. Our logistics guys are amazing. Our supply chain guys, operations guys, they are just so talented. So going into the organization was, again, my eyes got really big and I thought, wow, didn't know we existed. So um, about six years ago, Brambles was a holding company. We are listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. We're an Australian company headquartered in Sydney. And um, about six years ago, we moved more from an operating organization, uh, sorry, a holding company to an operating organization, which meant that we had to start changing the way we did things. Now, why did we do that? We, we needed to do that because we, were, we had no competition, and suddenly we started getting uh, competition in the market. We had to start to look at being just more efficient as an organization. And our CEO's vision was one business, one team. And what that has meant is how do we go to our customers with a common voice? How do we go to our employees with a common voice? Um, and how do we go to our suppliers? And we all speak the same language as well. And it was all about simplifying the organization. Now, that had a direct impact on the functions in the organization. So we have big transformation projects on the go at the moment. And they're called One Finance, One Procurement, One HR. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how One HR affected me. Because it's about how did we move a whole bunch of HR people around the world to start doing things in, a, in the same way, in a simplified way, so that it was easier for our employees. Just a little bit about my story. Um, I started in 2008, um, and I joined um, to set up a talent management center of expertise. So that's my background, talent management. And back in, so between 2008, 2014, the talent management center, center of expertise did all the stuff on the left. 
In um, 2015, so last year, I was asked to set up a um, learning and development center of expertise. The reason being, good old Dave Ulrich, uh, we've got shared services, we're redefining the role of the HR business partner, and we have three centers of expertise, remuneration and benefits, talent management, learning and development. <laughs> talent management was very easy to set up because there wasn't anything. So I had green fields, and I could play and do what I wanted. Boy, oh boy, this learning and development one is really doing my head in. And the reason is because there was learning and development all over the place. And, um, and I think a lot of people felt that they were having to give things up. And so the stakeholder management has been really challenging. I've, I've gone through a massive learning curve myself. Um, but what we've done is, you'll see there, that's what now sits in the Learning and Development Centre of Expertise, and that's what we moved into it. So in talent management, I introduced leadership development. We didn't have anything. Now we've moved it into learning and development, and we've formed a leadership academy. And I'll talk very briefly about that one in a moment. Um, high potential development was sitting in talent management. It's now sitting in learning and development as well. Inclusion and diversity, we've also moved over. Um, because it's about behavior. And mandatory training, well, someone's got to do it, so you know, we do that as well. And um, so that's what is in there. And we also introduced, because we didn't have a global learning management system, and we introduced one. I could talk to you for about four hours about an LMS and how it's actually driving the wrong behavior or it was driving my behavior in the wrong direction because I was starting to try and push everything through our LMS. You know what? <laughs> it doesn't work. As, um, as Andrew said, people learn in lots of different ways. So um, that, that's one of the challenges I'm looking at at the moment. So what needed to change? When we set up the Learning and Development Center of Expertise, what was happening? They were training people all over the world, and it, there was no consistency. Loads of duplication. Um, the same thing was happening in Australia, and it was happening in the US. Uh, we had a huge knot invented here. So don't you come here from HQ and tell us what to do. Some people are smiling at that one. Um, there was a lot of, you know what, there were some really good local solutions, um, but there was no knowledge sharing. So there was good stuff happening, um, but it wasn't being shared. And we were wasting a huge amount of money. And um, consistently over the last six years, our employee engagement growth and development score has been the lowest of all our engagement scores. Now, some of that has to do with um, people don't know how to manage their careers. But a lot of it is around the, um, you know, I don't know what training and development is available for me. So how did we start to centralize? Well, you have to have enablers in place. So we had the One HR change program, which helped. Uh, we, we implemented Cornerstone On Demand. Um, we've also implemented Workday. Um, can you believe it? An organization our size, we've only just in implemented an HRIS. So now we know exactly how many employees we've got and where they are. A year ago, we didn't. Um, and that little thing over there is actually because there was a huge collaborative spirit. And I think one of, the, one of the great things was when I built the Talent Management Center of Expertise, I developed great relationships with, with business leaders and with the HR folks. And so it was, I had an open door. And I think that was, that was great. I think it, it probably would have been a little bit harder for someone to come in from the outside and try and do this. Um, I think that the relationship side is really important. So what have we learned? Well, the first thing is um, we really have been asking, before we even started doing anything around a centralized function, um, what have we already got around the world? And even more importantly, is it having any impact at all? Um, what does the data say? And we've done some great analysis of just about everything we've got, like our 360s, our leadership assessments, the development centers that we run, um, our engagement surveys. And they're saying the same thing over and over again. So we know what we're really good at, and we know where we need to develop our people. 
And I can, anyone interested, I can share with you because I bet most organisations it's the same thing. Um, what is our strategy and what capability do we need for the future? Because our world is changing too in supply chain. So, um, you know, to quote our uh, keynote speaker this morning, what got you here won't get you there. We are really in that space in our organization at the moment. Um, and then we looked at what have we got, and then we partnered really closely with, 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 the, with our colleagues in talent management to look at, well, what capabilities do we have? Um, what do we need to take this organization into the future? And what's the gap? And that um, helped us to start to prioritize what we needed to do in learning and development. And then the question is, can we build some of this stuff, or do we have to go out and actually buy the skills in? Because some of it is long term, and um, some of it, and I work for an organization that, that's great. It really does believe in investing for the future. So we can do a lot of long-term development, but some things you've just got to go out and, and steal the best people, steal shamelessly from other organizations similar to our own. Um, and it was really being holistic. So it really was working closely with talent management so that we were making sure that we were addressing the right gaps. That, by the way, is one of my um, high potential programs. I took a, a bunch of high potential leaders to India. I discovered this little gem called the School of Inspired Leadership. It was just awesome. And we did mindfulness stuff for a whole week. It was brilliant. Um, and that's, that's some of the stuff that we do in our organization. So another, another lesson was, how do we partner with the business? So what we did was we went out to all our functions and we formed um, steering committees made up of our senior, senior business leaders. And each one of those steering committees is actually sponsored and led by the head of that function. And then um, we, they selected their subject matter experts. We're not, what do I know about logistics planning? Absolutely nothing. Um, but I can help them to look at what's the best way to um, ensure that we build those capabilities in the organization. And the most important thing was part of the design of absolutely everything we've done is how do we measure the impact? How do we make sure this is making a difference? To go back to what Andrew was saying, and if it doesn't, stop doing it. So what is the impact? Um, another lesson we learned was, well, <coughs> we were so enthusiastic about doing stuff, we forgot we had an IT department. Um, and very soon, it was like hitting a brick wall. Whoops. It was like hitting a brick wall. Um, we now partner with them. In fact, one of my colleagues, I dragged him along here, and he's downstairs. I've said, go and look at every exhibition stand there is. Go and learn about GOMOs and MOOCs and everything else you can think of. And he was looking at me going, OK. So I'm going to meet him for lunch and see what he's learned, because we really have to leverage whatever technology we already have, but also what else is out there. Because we've never done this stuff before in our organization. So become good friends with IT is a very important part. So let me give you some practical examples. We built a supply chain academy. Now, the steering committee, we thought, OK, what do we know? We're L&D. We thought that the steering committee were going to say to us, can you build us a whole lot of programs that are going to help build better capability in our supply chain function? That's not what they wanted. They said, we're a supply chain organization. We want everybody in this organization to understand what we do, regardless of whether you're in finance, HR, operations, or logistics. And so that's what we did. We, we went out and we identified, I know you're not supposed to do plugs, but they've been awesome. Um, we've been working with Leo Learning, um, and they've been helping us um, build our academies. And um, what we've developed um, as an initial part of the academy is um, six on-demand modules. And, there, and there's all kinds of different technologies. We've also, which is really important to be inclusive, we've also translated it into Spanish because it's the second biggest language spoken in our organization. And um, the content was delivered globally by SMEs. And what we've also got is we've got a game called Ship It, which um, it's a game which it's got four levels and you have to move stuff around the world without upsetting your customers, without losing money, 
and without um, increasing your CO2 emissions. Well, I can't get past level two. It keeps going, duh, go back to your day job. So it really does illustrate how, um, how complex our organization is. And we're now starting to use this in all our onboarding as well for new employees. What's, what's been fun is that the head of our supply chain um, yammered this in our internal yammer. And he said, OK, challenge. Who's going to beat me and get the most points? Because when you play the game, you go onto a leaderboard, which everyone who's playing can actually see. So there's a huge amount of competition around who's doing best. And it's not our head of supply chain, interestingly enough. It's actually someone in HR. Um, so that's what it looks like. That's the landing page of our um, Supply Chain Academy. And what you can see there is the, the six modules. And you know, there's all kinds of things like there's, there's click through, there's videos, um, there's, um, you know, those little, you know, when you, I, I can't remember, never remember what you call it, when someone speaks and you sketch, you know, and that, there's that. Um, and um, so there's all different interesting ways of getting the message across. And then there's the supply chain game at the end as well. Um, and that's on our main um, um, internet um, in the organization. The other one that we've um, done, which I wanted to illustrate uh, quickly, is our um, leadership academy. <coughs> so when we were doing leadership development, it was all classroom, working with a business school, working with the Center for Creative Leadership, really good stuff. Um, but we all know people learn differently, and we all know that uh, we need short bite-sized chunks because people are busy, jobs are getting bigger, people have less time. So um, what we've done here is we've still got some classroom training. We've got discovery weeks, like the one where I took a group of people to India. We've got all that stuff, but we've also got um, a leadership academy, which has two parts to it at the moment. This is, um, we partner with Skillsoft, and um, what we've done is we've got um, buckets of competencies, I suppose you could call them, for the organization, and they're the ones, team, interaction, customer performance, and strategy. And what we've done is we've linked um, the content that's in, um, in Skillsoft into there. And again, there's videos. There's um, uh, blue, executive blueprints. There's TED Talks. There's books. There's online things. So it's catering for all kinds of different learning styles. And um, the other part of the Leadership Academy is, um, is a blended piece, which is face-to-face um, there's two face-to-face -face modules, and there's three that are virtual. Um, and a lot of it is self-study. And we've, uh, we've rolled that out to our manager population around the world. And um, we've, we've so far, we've um, rolled it out in um, 20 countries and in eight different languages. So again, we are being inclusive. Because that, for me, is one of the most important um, aspects and philosophies around what we do in learning and development. So. What's the progress so far? First of all, there's more equity. Because what we did when we started to build this um, L&D center of expertise is we went out to all the businesses and we said, what have you got in your learning and development budget? Oh, it's, it's quite an interesting question to ask. Um, I think there's still some money under the table because they don't quite trust us yet. And, but what it did was because our business, our big business units, we're giving us big amounts of money, and our smaller business units, like Japan, didn't have anything. It meant we could pool everything. It's, it's common sense, isn't it? Um, we could pool everything, and we could make it available to everybody. So we've now reached everybody, regardless of the size or the success of the business unit. And also, the equity is also around um, having the different languages. Um, the academy programs are clearly linked to business outcomes. So there's absolutely nothing we do that if we can't measure the impact of a particular um, piece of learning, regardless of how it's delivered, don't care how it's delivered, then we go away and we talk to the business again and we say, we don't know how to measure this. And if they don't know how to measure it, then we say, OK, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Maybe we should be doing something else. And the last piece is we are really starting to establish that culture of learning. I'm, listen, it's not perfect. 
You know, this is not even a year old. Um, we're on a journey, and um, we're still on that journey. Um, there are hiccups, um, but overall, what we are creating in the organization is a bit of a buzz about the fact that you can do stuff if you collaborate, if you co-create, and if you pool your resources, it's absolutely amazing what you can achieve in the organization. So that is the story of Brambles and what we've done so far. Thanks for listening. <laughs> CEO, one business, one team, has worked its way through and is being represented through in the talent and learning strategy. Before we go on to the questions, I'd like to hand back to you. And you know, sure. Lynn, you said about the spirit of collaboration and sharing has really starting to leverage some change in the organisation. We want to see change in our own organisation. So in the spirit of collaboration and sharing, I'd like you to kind of go back to the people you were originally talking to this, before we started this session about what you wanted to get out of this and to just identify some of the things that you've picked up, some of the things that you've learned, possibly something that you'd like to dig in a little bit deeper. So for a few minutes, if you'd like to talk to each other and then we'll come back and bring your observations. Let's pull the learning in this room and we'll share that with, um, with Lynn and with Andrew. So turn to each other. What have you learned from so far? What would you think you might like to put into practice? What would you like to be able to ask the speakers? So just a couple of minutes doing that um, and you can speak now. I'd like to um, give us the opportunity. I mean, I think the key thing about these events is not just about what we hear about from the front, but what we can learn from each other, the people that we meet, and how we can help each other actually put some of these things into practice and take action. So it's great that we had those conversations. I'd like to invite Andrew and Lynn to come back and maybe kind of you to reflect on some of the things that you've learned and also to ask any questions because all three of us are really keen that you can go away and actually do something different. So if you need hints, tips, clarification, we've got a few minutes now before lunch for you to ask those questions. We've got the first one over here. So, Lynn, the, just to, to clarify the question, what do you measure, what's important to measure, and how do you do it? Briefly. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And it does very much depend on, on what it is. So if I look at the... Um, uh, in the Supply Chain Academy, we have a very... We've got a very strong value in our organisation around... We call it zero harm. And um, so when we um, developed um, modules around um, safety awareness and zero harm, uh, one of the measures that we have in every single plant, and there's about 800 plants around the world that clean our stuff before it goes back to the customer, um, they, they have a measure which is uh, the injury frequency rate. So what we do is we sit with the supply chain guys beforehand and we say, what's the current inju injury frequency rate? And obviously, we'd like it to be zero. Um, and so what percentage would you like it to drop by in this next financial year? And uh, then what we, and we've just, we've just done it because our financial year ends in the end of June. So we looked at it last year. And, um, and if there is a significant drop, then we know that it's having the impact because it's about changing behavior in the plants. So that's, like, that's just, just one like, example. That's a brilliant example of where it's not about alignment, it's about integration, where yeah. the learning activity is entirely driven by the performance within the business. You're not yeah. building another learning metric. Yeah. Okay, we've got an observation here as well from the... So for me, the question there is, there's obviously some learning in the organization. But how do you link it up to a specific intervention? 
because you may have a course, but the course isn't what's changing the behaviours. There's some other learning that's happening, discussions, awareness. How do you know it's linked to the intervention you've done as opposed to just the organisation is learning and get, getting mm. better without that intervention? Mm. Is that aimed at me? Well, what I did with, in relation to mine is the, the content that was then created, there was a subject matter expert attached to it. The SME wasn't within learning and development. The SME was within the business. So we took, for example, risk management. You know, within a council, there's areas of risk all over the place. So we have a particular risk manager within the organisation. They wanted to develop learning on it. So they're able to track the... Um, you know, the performance of the business in terms of risk. But what they were responsible for was then the curation of the content that sat on the risk management page. So what they did is we showed them how to build up comic strips, we showed them how to build RSS feeds, we showed them uh, how to run FAQ sessions, chat rooms, um, uh, you know, open uh, Google Hangouts, uh, curated resources around books, etc., uh, etc. Et but what we did is we made them, because they were responsible for the content, what they would do is see everybody who accessed it. And then I go to those people and say, what was the most valuable? And that then comes down to the evaluation piece. You can't evaluate this with Kirkpatrick. You have to go Brinkerhoff, success case methodology. Highly recommend. If you haven't read it, go and read it. You know, Robert O. Brinkerhoff and success case method. It's all about the qualitative and quantitative results that you can expect to get from the end of it. So they would go out, discuss this with a sample of people, and find out which content worked the best. And then you're able to demonstrate causational effect from somebody learns this, and that's the benefit in the business. Can I make an observation on that from the work we've been doing in the research? We found that the top performing organisations aren't as much hung up on the ROI methodology, but about having that conversation, Lynn, that you had with the business having that confidence to say, we know this is important, you've said it is, I don't know how to measure it, let's do it together, help me to do it together. And one of the things that I was really surprised, we did, I did a, an article about the things we need to let go of in order to move on, <laughs> and our preoccupation with ROI and needing to feel that we have to demonstrate something in order to get business buy-in, I think possibly is holding us back. And Lynn, the fact that you were quite happy to have the conversation and say, mm. you know what, let's do this together, that is a really clear characteristic of some of these top performing learning teams because it's something we need to co-own rather than just, you know, um, look at that. Let's and have some can other... I, can I just add something mm. else just very quickly? Because, I mean, you're talking about the holy grail of L&D, aren't you? Um, and um, I'm going through a conversation right now with my boss who sits in Sydney, so it's quite interesting. Um, we are very big on sustainability reporting. Um, and one of the things in our sustainability report, we're very proud to say is how many training hours. Um, and it goes up every year. And since we've had Cornerstone, it's gone up exponentially. And everyone's saying, wow, this is amazing. When I'm looking at it and thinking, why are we doing that? Because again, you know, you can attend a program, but what is the impact? So I would, and I'm having this conversation now to say, <clears throat> I think we need to change our sustainability reporting. I'll, I'll let you all know how it goes. Um, but it's very much around, um, we look, and this is, it's too soon at the moment to measure the management <laughs> training we've been doing across the world, because we've only been doing it for nine months. But in our, ne not this engagement survey, but our next one, we want to see if there's been a shift in the my manager uh, question. There's a couple of questions in there. <laughs> Has there been a shift? Um, hopefully up. Um, and, this, and the second thing is, what other mechanisms, what discussions are happening in the organization? Because I've learned, and it took me a while to understand that as the person heading up l and I can't control everything to do with L&D in our organization because people <laughs> yammer. And they Facebook, and they LinkedIn, and they, do, they go and watch a TED talk on their train on the way into work. You know what? That doesn't go through Cornerstone. So those training hours are irrelevant. And so I'm now interested in looking at how do we track the conversations that are going on, and what are those conversations? That's great. Who else has got some observation or a question? I've got one at the back here. This is for Lynn. I'm just curious as to how you understand that your learning culture is improving in such a big organisation. Mm -hmm. um, 
Can you ask me that in a year's time? <laughs> I think the only way we are seeing it at the moment is um, by what people are doing. Um, and but when I say what people are doing, it is what are they saying when they yammer? So um, we've had a lot of activity at the moment on did you see this amazing thing on Cornerstone? This is what I got from it. And a whole conversation starts. That never used to happen. Or someone would say, saw a great TED talk. This is what I got out of it. And a conversation happens. Those things are starting to happen. Um, and that, for me, says people are starting to take um, ownership and be more self-directed in their learning. And they're not just expecting us to sit there and, you know, throw stuff at them. Thank you. Um, OK. Have you got a loud voice from the back that I'd be able to...? OK, thank you. So the question there about when you're introducing change, user reluctance, did you get anything? And, and I guess the, to both of you, because you're both doing things differently. Yeah. So Andrew, do you want to go first? Um, Thank you. Yeah, people expect to go to a classroom and go to a course. There's only four kinds of people who ever go on training courses. There's people who want to learn something. That's the smallest percentage. <laughs> it's true. Second group of people are tourists. OK, they fancy a day out of the office. They can tell everybody about it afterwards. They have souvenirs. They've even got postcards. Look at these slides I've got. I met this lovely person who works in finance. They were lovely. I had this brilliant conversation over lunch. But they don't learn anything. They don't do anything differently as a result of it. They might make some connections. Third group of people are there to be fixed, in inverted commas. They do something wrong, and they get put on a course. This is why people get put on diversity courses. They get put on time management courses, yeah? to be fixed, but it won't fix them. School. It won't <laughs> fix them. Yeah, and the last group of people are there because my manager sent me. Yeah. Yeah. So when you get through and realise that that's most of the people who are going on training courses and you stop doing them, people generally go, well, how am I going to spend time out of the office? Well, if you build spaces for them to have conversations, if you open up your training rooms to say, you want to learn presentation <coughs> skills, we'll put a laptop in there, send us a presentation to a group of people, and you can practice with each other without having somebody in front of you criticising what you do and don't do, just space to practice. People then just become familiar with it. And the resistance tends to be what you think people will be anti, as opposed to what they're already doing. Most people went, this is great, and off they went. Lynn, what about you? Well, I, I, do you know what? I'm, I love that idea of representation skills. I'm going to steal that one shamelessly. I think that's, that's great. great. Um, the biggest... OK, so the biggest... Um, criticism, I suppose, was um, some of the HR people saying um, learning and development in this organisation um, isn't as important as it used to be because, and when I say because, well, because we're not seeing as many programmes. And then I would say, well, what do you mean by programmes? Well, you know, courses. Um, I was gutted when I had this conversation. I thought, oh. Um, so it's about educating not just business, but it's about educating um, our HR business partners as well that people learn differently. And it's not just about courses. So my biggest, um, my biggest criticism came from HR. OK, um, we've only got a few minutes left. Before we go on to the final question, we've been talking today about how can we get something practical out of today, and you've given us lots of practical ideas. I'd like to challenge you in the last couple of moments, if you've got a piece of paper or something in front of you, to write down the one thing that you think you would like to try and do differently as a result of today. I'd like you to hand it in, almost like a bit of a, a commitment, and we'll group it together and see how, how the uh, sessions go, and I'll tweet out some of the key actions. But if there's one thing that you think you'd like to do differently, put it on a piece of paper, give it to me at the end, and by the end of today, we'll have group, um, sent out some ideas so that you can help each other achieve that. We've got a couple of minutes. I've got one quick question still to go with a few quick answers. So there's a li little emphasis on a certain word in there. Okay. Mark, what's your quick question? <laughs> for setting my expectations. Um, a lot of HR strategies, my observation, it, um, do start with this concept of almost like 
thinking about knowledge workers as, as, as the core part of the strategy, and, and our organisation is just as much at fault as this. Well, we've got somewhere north of about 70,000 people whose time is managed to the minute, every day, all day, every week. What insight have you got around how some of these strategies can address okay. that all the stuff we talked about is, gr is great when you've got time to do it? Okay. Yeah. Um, 52 minutes. Um, our staff budget for learning and development was about 2.5% of our staff cost. Staff are contracted to work a 35-hour week. 2.5% of a 35-hour week is 52 minutes. So everything we built added up to a budget of 52 minutes because that's the investment that you should be putting in for people every day. So 26 minutes to watch a, a TED Talk with a Q&A afterwards. 13 minutes, have a conversation with somebody, six or seven minutes to do one of those case study questionnaires. So everything was built to a budget of 52 minutes. It changes the conversation between the manager and the individual saying, OK, well, what I'm going to do is this week I'm going to do this TED Talk, next week I'm going to double things up, the week after I'll do a few tests. Andrew, is this on your blog? Uh, yes, I'll, well, re I'll republish it. OK, so there's some, some practical ideas there. Lynn, have you got a quick answer for yes, Mark as well? of the 14,000 people we have worldwide, about 7,000 and a half thousand are in plants where everything they do is measured by the hour and what we're going through at the moment we're going through a process of empowering the plant manager to do stuff with them because that's how we reach them um, so we've 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 let go of it and we're giving them the toolkits and they're doing it in the plants that's great thank you so much Hopefully you've had something very practical that you can take away from today. Certainly in the research that you've got in your bags, people who do things, like you guys, are getting considerably better results. So we are trying to kind of help you to really work out on what you can take away and take action on. So leave me your actions, couple more things. Downstairs there are some amazing um, action-oriented sessions going on. Lynn's coming down, Sunda is coming down, Bob Mosher is coming down onto the exhibition floor to run conference exchanges. So if you want to look at performance support, pick up with Lynn, go onto the exchanges um, site on the towardsmaturity.org and then come and join in a much smaller conversation where you can work out action plans. So that's what's available. Thank you guys and thank you for your contributions as well.